back to the Thinking Critical Comic Book Podcast. It's time for some more comic book writing 101. We're down to one professor today. We've only got Mr. Mark Pellegrini. I do imagine that Aaron Sparrow will be joining us here in a little bit. Today, we're going to be talking about world building. This is probably, I don't know, is this the most fun thing that you can do when you're writing a comic, Mark? It's my favorite part, honestly. I really like writing source books and story Bibles and character profiles and all that stuff. That's, I don't know, I, I've met a lot of writers who don't do that stuff in advance before they start scripting. And one, I think that's just um, uh, a bad strategy because then you don't know what you're going to write before you write it. But also, like, why? You're, you're skipping the part that's the most fun. <laughs> Yeah, this is when you're kind of building the history, the legacy, what's the moral kind of centers of the, the universe and things of that nature, depending on the type of story that you're writing. So, uh, yeah, it's going to be fun stuff. I imagine, like I said, Aaron Sparrow will, will be returning. So, Mark, we're going to do this solo until Aaron gets here. Is that good right. with you? Yeah, I can do that. All right. Let's talk about the purpose of world building. Essentially, the ba basic purpose that you're, you're going to be getting out of world building is you're going to give their story structure and you're going to be establishing settings. But one of the coolest things that you can do within your world building, in my opinion, is creating that connective tissue that when you've been reading something for maybe two or three years and you finally get to this moment and it calls back to something that happened 18 months ago or even three years ago, and it finally connects this world together. You've been waiting for that payoff. It just feels amazing. It's really gratifying, but it's also when, as when you're the writer or the artist and you're the, the creator behind it, it can be kind of it can, it can make it really anxious because you want to get to that part in volume five and you're on volume one. You're like, oh, it's going to be two years before I get to that point where, you know, everything comes together and all the pieces uh, fit into place. You just got to be patient and, you know, uh, don't. Uh, uh, I'm going to use a. Uh, I was going to use a dirty euphemism. Uh, don't uh, show your hand uh, too too early. As anxious as you might get, and then it'll all pay off if you're patient. Now you've been working on the Common American Universe. You've been working on uh, USAGI. They're going to be connecting soon. You guys have been building to that world uh, connecting moment for a while, right? Uh, yep. So. Uh, Black Ops, USAGI, and Common America coexist in a shared universe, and we've had um, minor crossover characters and elements, like we have a, uh, Misha, uh, who was a major part of Black Ops 3, uh, but if you just read Common America, we try to keep the books, um, they're connected, but they're also separate enough that you can read one or the other and follow the story along. You don't have to read both if you don't want to. But we do have the big crossover event um, that is called Black Ops X Common America, and we do want people to read that one because that's where the, the two books finally come together. But we built up towards that, um, partly with Easter eggs and little crossover characters, but also with a uh, four-part uh, backup serial that we had running in both books that was leading up to the uh, the big event crossover. So we've been kind of like guiding the story and the audience along for about uh, two years. Yeah, so you've been world building so you can get to this one big moment. I don't know. Is there anything else that you can say about like the purpose of world building or something you that you try to achieve with your world building while you're doing it? Well, you want to do it. Um, you want to set it up in advance. You know, write out your character profiles. Write out your. Um, it's it's kind of like what we were talking about. I think on our first video, the uh, the pre-scripting phase where you basically you you write out the summary of your story. You you get your arcs, uh, not just for your single issues, but also for your entire year's worth of stories, your entire story arc. You want to set all that stuff up in advance, but you also want to set up your character arcs. You want to write out um, your characters, where who they are, where they came from, basically like one of those um, Marvel Universe A to Z profiles. I like writing those for the characters. So a lot of like that information- Like <laughs> Yeah, Similarian, yeah, right? <laughs> so something like that, but- and the important thing is you don't necessarily have to put all of that information into your book. It's just so that when you look at those profiles and you have a three-dimensional version of the character already planned out before you put them into the story. And that also goes with world building for your setting, uh, whether it's uh, a fantasy world or an alternate universe, or even if it's in like the quote unquote real world and there isn't anything uh, fantastic about it, you still want to set up like, what's the time period? Uh, what's the uh, the political setting of the, of the book? Like what's, what's the conflict? Uh, who are the characters? Where do they come from? All of that is world building. And regardless of what genre you're writing in, you need to do it in advance. Absolutely, so world building, 
can be a, a lot of work. You could you can write down hundreds, if not thousands, of pages of world building that never actually make it into your story, but it's driving the tone and setting of your story and and basically laying out how your characters are going to react, the things that are going to happen in this world. And it's probably can be the most fun thing. It's the part that I, I think would be the most fun because it's all about creativity. Exactly. And the fun thing about uh, world building is that it can be something subtle. Like I think one of the best examples I always use is, is Ghostbusters. If you go back and you watch that movie, it takes place in, you know, the quote unquote, the real world, but ghosts are a thing in the real world where there are people out there who don't necessarily believe in them, but there are people out there who encounter them enough that a service uh, of Ghostbusters, of paranormal exterminators, is something people need. It's a service people would pay money for, and that it becomes a new small business venture for the main characters. And so it's it's a normal world that has just this one little thing off about it that's different, but it's interwoven in the story subtly enough that um, it gives the, the the setting grounding. And that's like a subtle piece of world building that I always liked about Ghostbusters. Absolutely. So let's get into some of the things that you need to think about. The first big thing you really need to, to decide on or know what you're going to be doing when you're doing your world building is you've got to think about your genre because that is going to establish a lot of what your your readers are going to expect in the story as far as the setting. It's also going to establish maybe some of the rules that you're going to get into. We'll get into rules here in a second. Also, you need to be thinking about what kind of world are you going to be working in? Is this an imaginary world? An alternate reality, a la Watchmen universe. Is this the real world, kind of like Ed Brubaker's criminal universe? That you know, these are fictional characters essentially in our world. So you got to know exactly uh, what kind of world you're going to be in, but also the genre that that you're going to be writing. So you know the settings and, and everything you're going to have to be setting up for your world. Exactly, and some uh, settings, some genres require more work than others. So if you're writing your own fantasy world, like you're doing your own sword and sorcery, uh, Middle Earth, Lord of the Rings esque kind of story, I almost find like writing those or those kinds of stories is easier because you you are in a fictional world, um, you're building it from the ground up, and yes, you're building your world from the ground up, but it's anything goes, whatever you want, you can put it in there. I think it's a lot harder to uh, write stories that take place in an actual real world period setting. Like I, I wrote a, a novel that took place in the old west and there was so much research that i had to do yes. like i had to you know because you want to be myself. authentic exactly because you, you can't have anachronisms and that can be the hardest thing like every time i would write like a turn of phrase i'd like oh did they have this turn of phrase back in the 1880s oh god and i had to go and like look it up like nope nope that that turn of phrase wasn't invented until 1920. I can't use that. Like, okay, they got guns. Like, oh, they, they're going to this town. Did this town exist? No, my story set in 1887 and that town was founded in 1889. So I can't use that, you know, stuff like that where you keep getting kneecapped every time you do your research, but you have to do your research because that's part of the world building to be, you know, to be authentic to your story and your setting. Whereas if you're writing, you know, something that takes place like in your version of the the Hyborian age, then you can just make up, oh, there's a temple here, there's a there's a country over here called whatever is Stan. There's a you know but there's a castle it takes over here. More and... Time to establish <laughs> that in your story. And that's the thing too, is that is that is the the shortcoming is that you have to even if you're making everything up, then you have to deliver that information to the reader yourself. You don't have any um, shorthand helper like a period setting. You know, when people we've said it in the old west, people already have their idea of what the old west is. So you know, it's doing some of the work for you. Even though personally, I find having to do all that research and having to cut my myself off if I accidentally uh, put in an anachronism and I don't want to do that, I find that more annoying. But if you are doing a completely fictional universe, uh, yes, you have to uh, disperse all that information to the audience, and you have to do it in a way that's organic and is not just a massive info dump. And that can be the hardest thing, is, is to build your world organically and uh, in a way that's, I don't know, uh, enjoyable to read, but it doesn't feel like you're being lectured at. So to me, it, the one genre and setting that I think would probably kind of be the easiest is like post-apocalyptic. There's going to be a lot of things that are familiar to you, but it's all changed and in, from the perspective of your character he's probably not going to know everything that's happened so you can explore things and as he's discovering things that's when you learn about it and i think that's why post-apocalyptic fiction is so popular because it's in a way it's almost the easiest to write it's like oh okay i get to have um 
a real world setting, but it's it's in the future, so I don't have to uh, do any research about this or that. Oh, and I can uh, make up my own world with you know because the politics and, and the landscape has been restructured, so I can have my uh, different city states here and there that just happen to be set in real world locations. Blah blah blah. Like a lot of that stuff is done for you. Um, the capital think, is now in you know uh, the Sky Dome. That's what. Yeah, it is. right. And the uh, magic has returned. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I think, uh, yeah, that's basically that for, for that part. <laughs> so I did want to talk about like one world I think everyone basically knows about. It's Game of Thrones. Obviously, you got the the, the uh, novels, you got the TV show, you've also got the comic books. I think most people are probably aware of the Game of World or Game of Thrones setting, but you could tell that story literally in any setting, depending on the genre. But because he, he chose fantasy, you know, he had to have dragons and, you know, had to create all these lands. But you could tell Game of Thrones in a sci-fi setting. Well, I mean, heck, Star Wars, you know, Star Wars is a stealth remake of um, The Hidden Fortress, which is a samurai movie. And it has a whole bunch of samurai elements. Uh, geez, The Magnificent Seven is a remake of Seven Samurai. Um, the Man With No Name trilogy is adapted from Yojimbo. And, you know, it's... Feudal era Japan, very different from the American Old West, and yet these plots manage to uh, go from one genre, one setting, one time period to the other, and both are equally good. You can change the the genre. Some some storylines uh, are uh, one not one size fits all, but they they fit just about any uh, particular genre or narrative. Yeah, you just have to understand what the genre is and what people's expectations are. We do have a question from Common Sense. He, he wanted to know, what do you, do you have any thoughts on cyberpunk or post-cyberpunk genres as far as setting and uh, world building? Well, I mean, I've watched a lot of uh, cyberpunk anime. Now, I'm not exactly, it's not my genre. It's kind of like asking me about steampunk. Steampunk's not really my genre, so I, I don't really have too many opinions on it. Uh, I mean, I do like it. Um, I think the also it requires um, to write it authentically, you know, and we're just talking about research. It also does require on um, behalf of the author to have a certain level of tech savvy. And unfortunately, I didn't take any uh, IT courses, so I don't really have the tech savvy to write <laughs> the, the kind of, um, you know, sci-fi jargon that it's, it's different from like Star Trek, where you just throw out like, oh, it's like uh, we, we've got photon missiles and we have to... Uh, Whatever with the stupid TARDIS. I, I don't watch Star Trek or Doctor Who, but you know you can. It's a it's a sci-fi fantasy, so you can make up your own uh, crazy technology and your own words, mm -hmm. your own jargon, and as long as the sentences make sense to the the viewer, they can get the context. But you also cyber, yeah. there's accepted jargon within science fiction to where you don't have to make something up. You should probably just use the term that's yeah. accepted. Otherwise, you're going to confuse people. Yeah, right. It's like, oh, how do we travel faster than light? Oh, we'll use a wormhole generator or something like that. You know, like these these little phrases that are, that are cross uh, franchise that people or light speed or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> Where, but I think with cyberpunk, because it is like, you know, like Ghost in the Shell or something, it, it is semi grounded in um, if, if not uh, current day, then the not too distant future. And so you have to use uh, a certain turns a phrase and, and reference certain technology and you have to understand what it is and how it works or else the audience is going to uh, call you out and then or at least the audience that's more tech savvy than you are. And you're definitely going to have to have read a lot of stuff within the genre you want to create for. Like I said, because there's there's certain things that are consistent throughout. You know, if you're going to be writing fantasy, you probably, if you're going to be creating an elf, you don't want to call them something else. And if you do, it should be very close to that so people know what you're talking about. And that's the kind of research I like, the kind of research in which you want to write in this genre or if you want to be in this playground, then you've got to go read what other people have written within that genre. And that's what I find more fun than, you know, oh, I got to write an old West story. So now I got to go and, and do all this research to make sure that all these uh, turns of phrase and all these cities and all these things were really there at the time that I'm setting my book. Uh, whereas like, oh, I want to write something that's um, a weird fiction story. Oh, great. I'm going to go read H.P. Lovecraft. I'm going to go read Robert Block. I'm going to go read Robert E. Howard. I'm going to go read Clark Ashton Smith. It's going to be, and that's, that's fun. Um, mm -hmm. And even though you're not necessarily reading them to mine ideas from them, but just to understand the tone and that's what makes a weird fiction story, a weird fiction story, and not just a horror story or what makes, um, what makes that genre or that particular niche within that genre um, special and unique, and you're not just telling any old story. 
Absolutely. So let's get into to some of the rules. You're going to have, have to establish a lot of rules while you're doing your world building. You need to think about the tone of your setting. You know, is this going to be a bleak world? Is it a hopeful world? You're going to need to think about things like that. Like, what is the environment? Are you on Earth? Are you on another planet? Is, you know, is there breathable air? You know, what, what what's the environment of the setting that your, your characters and your story is going to play out in? What are, like, the political and moral cultures of the people in the time? Obviously, if you're setting in the real world, it's going to be pretty easy to establish. You're pretty much going to know what it is. But if you're talking about something happening in 2,000 years from now, how how have we evolved as people? You know, what what kind of path have we gone on? So those are some of the things you need to think about there. How do people communicate? You know, are we are we talking with aliens? You know, has English evolved to, into another language? Is English you know obsolete at this point? You know, does everyone speak Mandarin? You know, you got to think about, you know, communication. Maybe we're, we're telepathic at this point. You probably also need to identify the history of the world that you're in. You're going to need to incorporate that. And that's when you're talking about creating like your, your world Bible, where a lot of that information won't even be spelled out in the story, but it's going to drive the things and the morals and the culture of the people. And, uh, you know, since we're talking about comic books, there's going to be a lot of superheroes. You know, how do the powers operate? What are the rules around the powers? You need to establish things like that. If it's a, a world with magic, where is the magic derived from? How do people get to wield it? Do you need training? Are, do certain people just naturally have uh, inclinations to wield magic? Things of that nature. So you need to establish your rules, and then you have to follow them. Yeah, and that's the important thing. And this is why world building writing your source book, uh, writing your story Bible, doing your character profiles, doing all that stuff in advance is important. It's so you don't break your own rules because when you do, the audience notices and it takes them out of the immersion of the story. Now, there are, I'm reading a lot of uh, Silver Age Marvel stuff right now through those epic collections. And one thing I love is that almost every single Marvel comic um, during the Silver Age was set in a fantasy version of New York City. And it's and because the Marvel offices were in New York City, all the writers and artists lived in New York City. It feels very authentic. All the all the architecture, all the the landscape, the streets, uh, where the you know where these people live. You know it's a real place that existed at that time. It's just that sometimes you'd look up and you'd see Thor flying through the air, or, or Spider Man uh, zipping around, or sometimes the X Men would just be running through the street with a mob chasing after them. You know, and that's something that makes that version of New York really special. It's it's different from, you know, Batman or Superman, like Gotham City and Metropolis, which are basically based on, both cities are based on New York City or aspects of it, but they're still original settings. And so they don't have to have maps, even though in the 90s, Denny O'Neill did have a map of Gotham City to try and maintain a consistent geography. But for the most part, you can fudge it. Um, the Marvel Universe, they set it in New York, but everything else was was fair game. But you can also tell when you're reading, <laughs> yeah, just steer clear of Yancey Street. Um, but you can tell, like I can tell right now when I'm reading some of these um, Silver Age Marvel books, which uh, characters, which titles had their world building uh, from the done in advance and which didn't, and it really shows. Like right now, I'm, I'm on um, the first volume of Spider-Man, and everything about Peter Parker and his universe is there from uh, that 11 pager in Amazing Fantasy, and then in the first like three issues of Amazing, everything. So Peter Parker, the Parker luck, my Spidey sense is tingling, J. Jonah Jameson getting pictures to help uh, pay Aunt May's bills, Aunt May always being sick, all the villains showing up. Like Peter is a, is fully formed in those first few issues from uh, creation to how we view him now. And it's, it's incredibly solid, and I think that's why Spider-Man did as well as it did back then. It was, it was a huge juggernaut of sales right out the gate. And then the opposite end of the spectrum, you have Silver Age X-Men, where they just had no idea what they were doing with these characters, what the rules were, what mutants were. And so the first few issues of X-Men, um, the X-Men are, are celebrity superheroes. People love mutants. Uh, they can't go out in the streets, not because they'll get like rocks thrown at them, but because mobs will come and like, oh, I want your autograph, Cyclops. Oh, like, uh, Angel, you're so handsome. I, I want to hug you. And like, everybody loves them. And then just all of a sudden, I think by like issue seven, uh, they Stanley changed his mind. It's like, oh, okay, no, now the mutants are going to be hated and they're going to be an allegory for civil rights and everyone's going to want to hunt them and humans hate mutants. And it just like, with no explanation, just totally changes. 
And as I'm sitting there reading these issues I'm like, what, what, what the hell just happened? Um, and plot lines get dropped, characters and their relationships, their dynamics change completely. Um, Professor Xavier was in love with Jean Grey in the first issue and then it's never mentioned again. It's just dropped. Uh, Magneto had psychic powers the same as Professor X in the early issues and that just gets dropped and they decide, nah, he just has magnet powers. It's, they, they didn't think any of this stuff in advance and that's why X-Men, the original Silver Age X-Men sold very poorly and it never technically got canceled, but it went into reprints for like 10 years where they just didn't write new stories. But that's the difference. If you just want a good example of why you should do your world building in advance before you start and why you shouldn't, read uh, Silver Age Spider-Man and read Silver Age X-Men and compare the quality of the two. So I have another example about you need if you're going to establish rules and you don't have to, you don't you don't have to have the characters talk about it. You can show it. If you go in and you want or read the Ten of Swords event that was X-Men, you just talked about it in the new X-Men that we world that we have. The the characters leave Krakoa, they they enter other world, which is you know like a fantasy type world. And there's a character in there named Saturnine, and the uh, forces of, of Krakoa, the mutants, are going to face off with the forces of Arako, which are like hideous mutants that have been battling for a thousand years, and they're war-hardened, and they're going to fight in other world. And Saturnine is so powerful, she, she stops everybody in their tracks. They can still think, they can still feel, but they can't move, because she's that powerful. She's all-ruling, all-powerful, just... They establish it right there. We get to the end of the story, and the contest is broken down. There's about to be a war in other world. You have the forces of Krakoa again. You have the forces of, of Rocco, and they just fight. And Saturnine's like, I can't stop this for no known reason whatsoever. So you establish the rule. You get to the climax, and they completely break it, and it takes you right out of the story. You're like, how powerful is this character? I have to go back and read what I had read before because I I'm am I misremembering this? And it just it throws throws you completely out of the story. Yeah, and that's a problem too, is that you you need to establish your villains power levels and your heroes' power levels. You need you need to decide that before you even get started because that is a constant problem. And I think it's called power creep. It's when a villain is introduced and they are a an unstoppable challenge to the hero. And then slowly after each appearance, they get weaker and weaker and weaker until they're bebop and rock steady. Um, <laughs> and that's something that just, that happens so frequently is that you, you want, when you introduce your villain, you know, you want them to be imposing and impressive. You want them to uh, uh, right out the gate, beat up the juggernaut or something, but then you don't want to commit to that. And slowly but surely, your your villains lose their their threat, their menace, their power, and the reader can can tell, you know, and the reader reading that like, hey, wait, didn't this character just curb stomp the hero uh, a couple issues ago, and and now they're jobbing to them? What's going on? And yeah, like you said, it takes you out of it, like because you you realize you're reading a narrative that somebody else wrote. Um, as opposed to reading a story that's flowing so organically, you forget that it's fiction. Yeah, it's it's crazy. You, you establish these rules so you can uh, follow them. Now, there is a setting and a type of story where you don't establish any rules and you don't follow any of them. It's called literary nonsense. <laughs> but you don't want your comic story to, to fall into literary nonsense unless that's the purpose. You know what I mean? Right. I mean, if you're doing um, a, a humor story and it, and that kind of consistency really doesn't matter if you're doing a satire or you're doing something goofy. But again, you have to know what genre you're writing in from the get go. Uh, if you're not doing that, though, if you're doing something that you want people to take seriously, if you want people to feel um, tension and feel like there are stakes, then you have to be consistent with that. I mean, it's like so when you're watching a movie, the whole purpose of a movie is to draw you into it and make you forget that you're watching a movie where the only thing you're thinking about, you're almost not even thinking at all. You're just watching the events on screen. You're completely immersed in it. Immersion is the key. And then a boom mic drops in, you know, from just out of frame. And you're like, oh, that's right. I'm watching a movie. I can, you know, suddenly see the, uh, you know, how it's being made. And that's what the literary version, like if you're reading a comic, you know, when something like that happens, that takes you out of the immersive experience, like, oh, that's right. The writer just screwed up and now I'm, I'm reminded that I'm reading a comic and it, it just kills the momentum of, of the experience and, and just stops you dead. Yeah, so the, the rules are important so you can establish the setting and how the people are going to operate, how people are going to uh, kind of communicate. So you can get some type of, 
uh, you know, flow through the story. People know kind of what to expect. Now, the, the important thing when you're doing a comic book is to take a, take a advantage of the medium. If you're writing prose, you're going to have to do a lot of explaining for world building, especially for like a fantasy comic or a fantasy novel. But if you're doing a comic book, you have a wonderful artist. In your case, you have Tim Lim. You got to show people what's going on. You know, you can demonstrate a lot of these world building aspects without even talking about them. You just have to see the character interact within the world as it is. And that's one of the huge advantages um, of a visual medium is like if you're writing prose and your character's journey to a new town, a new village, a new landscape, you've got to describe everything about that landscape. You've got to tell the history of that landscape. You've got to um, describe all the buildings, what the people look like. Art, you can do all of that in a picture's worth a thousand words. You can do all that in a splash page. Um, there's a a channel on YouTube called Super Eye Patch Wolf, and he does these great video essays, a lot of them on manga. And he talks about just um, the reading experience of manga. And one of his examples, and it's from a series I haven't read enough of, it's um, One Piece, I need to read more of it. But he points out in One Piece uh, what the artist does uh, whenever they go to a new island, because they're pirates and they go from island to island, and each island has its own unique um, inhabitants and culture and landscape and everything. And all of the world building is built into the art. So you absorb it subliminally. Like they go to one world with giant trees and you can see that all the houses are built out of the giant fruit in the giant trees. And they have like, you know, like Ewok village style, like uh, drawbridges going from like one big piece of fruit to the next. And like, there's a piece of fruit that's dying. And so they're dismantling the house to go build it another giant piece of fruit. And it's all of that's just in the art. You know, the characters don't have to stop and say, hey, look, they're building their houses out of the fruit. I guess they're doing that because this is their environment. And so that's how they've evolved. They don't have to do that. You as the reader are picking that up subliminally. And that's the kind of uh, wordless world building that um, you can do in a comic or a cartoon or any visual medium without having to have the characters stop and give exposition to explain something that the reader can see for themselves. Now, most people that have been watching the channel for a while, they'll probably know my favorite comic story is Rai from Matt Kitt and Clayton Crane, one of the better digital artists that you'll ever see. It's you know it's basically uh, 12 issues of Rai, and then the last four issues are at a, an event called 4001 AD. And there's so much world building done. Now, it, it is introduced by this young lady, and she's talking about the world she lives in, and, and it makes some explanations, and it says, you know, we're on a, you know, they're basically living on a satellite called New Japan, you know, in the future, you know, she has a robot sidekick that they give you, uh, you know, when you become 16, so you don't get lonely. Uh, basically, the the purpose is so they, they people don't enter into relationships, kind of stuff like that. But she talks about this character, this character, Rai. He's very mysterious. He shows up uh, here and there, but nobody knows anything. So you know that this character is going to show up. But when he does show up, Clayton Crane, as the artist, basically shows you how he appears out of New Japan and you can start to see the rules in which he operates because she doesn't know. She can't tell you how it is because she's never seen the character. She's only heard rumors. And they basically explain everything about Ryan, how he interacts with the world that he's in, basically by visual mediums. But you know to be out, be looking out for it. I thought it was really, really effective on world building. Obviously, you got these great displays of, of New Japan, you know, basically orbiting above Earth and things like that. But you know, you're gonna have to tell a little bit, but you wanna do as much as you can with the image themselves. Yeah, and so there, there are graceful ways to do it and um, ungraceful ways to do it or graceless ways to do it. And obviously exposition is the quickest and easiest way of getting world building across. Um, sometimes it, it just comes down to uh, you got no choice. So the very first volume of Black Ops, USAGI, um, we needed to set up, you know, the the world, the characters, because it, we, um, this story takes place in a world where there are these radioactive particles called chimeratons that, um, through one way or another, um, when they're when humans or animals are exposed to them, it um, it changes them. It gives them uh, various abilities that enhance um, something about them um, uh, uniquely. But the very first volume of USAGI, uh, the character is a rabbit, and he's not a cartoon rabbit. He's not a mutant rabbit. He can't talk or anything. He has no thought bubbles. He's just a rabbit. And he's going on this. He's a commando working for the uh, U.S. government, and he's on a mission to North Korea to stop a nuclear launch. Uh, we have to get that information across to the 
reader, but we have a character that can't talk and can't think, um, at least not in, in text. So we had to do, um, if I could go back again, I would probably have done it differently. But you guys did reports, to, right? Yes, we, we did a dossier narration. Yeah. So basically we have, um, we, we treat the story like it's something that's already happened and that there's a military document that's a debriefing that's describing the adventure um, and, and drops in the important bits of exposition for the reader to go along. Um, I think I wrote it too densely. I probably would have made the dossier narration sparser if I had to go back and do it again, but it was one of those like um, ends justify the means things. We, this is the first volume. We had to get that information across to the reader. It was a way that felt organic um, to the story because it is a, a military commando story. Um, but that is one of those things where sometimes you do have to rely on exposition and there are good ways and bad ways to do it. I mean, you have characters like uh, Watson from Sherlock Holmes and Watson's entire purpose is to ask Sherlock questions so that Sherlock can explain things to Watson when he's really explaining them to the audience. Otherwise, Sherlock would never say a word and we'd never understand what he's thinking or what he's doing or what's going on. Um, and you have a, and people love Watson. Watson's a popular character. Uh, but yeah, you have... Uh, and that dynamic has, has existed for 100, 200 years. I, I reread uh, uh, Timothy Zahn's Star Wars novels, uh, you know, the heir to the empire, the, the Thrawn trilogy. And Thrawn, uh, Grand Admiral Thrawn, he has a Watson character named Admiral Paleon. And that's all Admiral Paleon does is he just asks Thrawn questions so that Thrawn can explain. he's the master strategist and nobody <laughs> exactly. can, can, can think on his level. Exactly. So he has to dumb everything down for Paleon, but he's really dumbing it down for the audience, so that for the reader, so that we can understand. And that is a very useful and popular tool for exposition and getting world building and just getting um, context across to the reader. And there's good ways to do it and bad ways to do it. Um, you just have to have pra get practice at it, I guess. Absolutely. But if you're writing a comic book, if you're creating a comic, Please mm -hmm. take advantage of the medium. If you can show how this works, just show it. You don't have to tell everything. You know, uh, uh, Fist of the North Star has this one great image where, yeah, it's a post-apocalyptic, um, originally manga, then an anime. Yeah, it's post-apocalyptic. We all know that. But how post-apocalyptic is it? The very first thing you see in Fist of the North Star of the movie is the World Trade Center with a submarine like speared through the top of it. So you know that something bad, really bad, really flight. crazy went down. Yeah. Like it wasn't just, you know, like, oh, a meteor struck or like, oh, there's a virus. Like, no, something happened that put that put that submarine through the top of the World Trade Center. And it really like uh, ignites your imagination. Like, oh, damn, what happened here? So, yeah, that and that's purely visual. It never no one points it out or says anything. It's taking advantage of the medium. Yeah, it gives you a good idea. So let's move on to uh, uh oh, there we go. One of the things that I find with world building in comics, because a lot of these comics are told episodically, normally in 20 to 24 page bursts, is that they want to do all the world building in the first issue. And you get this enormous, enormous exposition dump. And it becomes the most boring, monotonous thing in the world. And there's no reason to come back because they forgot that it's really the character that drives the story within the setting. So you wanted to, to, to um, release this information and you're you're proud of your world and you want to get it out there but you're going to have to do it incrementally you're going to want to start on like a smaller uh, setting so you can start demonstrating and presenting the world they're in as you grow it over time right so the one of the worst things you can do is just dump your entire story bible into your first issue or your first chapter or whatever you want to call it um, one that's just way too much information for an audience to take in all at once and two, there's no graceful way to put that much information into 30 pages, 40 pages, even 60 pages, whatever you're, however many pages you're writing, you don't have enough space to do all that. Um, people like to think of like the first issue of their comic as being like the pilot of a TV series. And you'll always see pilots of the TV series that they, they do that. They dump all the information all at once in that first episode. But TV pilots are made that way so that <sighs> corporate executives can understand them. They Good aren't decisions. necessarily, the pilots are usually like the worst episode of the TV series for yeah. a lot of reasons. And usually that's one of them. But if you're writing an ongoing comic book series, you don't have to do that. Give enough information in the first issue to provide context for your world for the reader so that the reader can understand the stakes and the setting. And then save the rest for 
time release over the remaining issues. One, that way you've still got material to work with. You you still you're not putting everything out there in the first issue and then you got nothing left for issues two through whatever. Um, you wouldn't want to do that. That's like blowing your entire bank account all at once and then being broke for the rest of your life. You don't want that. Um, but I've noticed that a lot of writers tend to do that. Uh, they overwhelm the audience with world building. And I've also noticed that sometimes, now this is a TV example, and it's from Gargoyles, which everybody loves. Um, Gargoyles is a great TV show. Uh, but midway into season two, they get on a rowboat for 26 episodes, and it's just world building for 26 episodes. They go to a, a different, it's a magic rowboat. So sometimes they'll end up in a different part of the world, and they'll see what gargoyles are like in Japan. And sometimes they'll go back in time, and they'll see what gargoyles were like, you know, 200 years ago. And sometimes they'll go to the future and see what gargoyles are like in the future. And it introduces all these characters and, and concepts and new settings. But it's just 26 straight episodes of world building, and it's exhausting. Uh, that a lot of people complain about the the 26 episode world tour arc or the rowboat arc, and that's and for a show that did its world building so well in the first season and a half, where it just introduced things organically, um, it was built on the backs of the characters. Um, new hist pieces of history would be like uh, dropped here and there, and then you'd see how they interconnected. Like all oh, that was great, and then just suddenly for some reason, midway into season two, they're on a rowboat, and it's just this really graceless info dump of exposition and world building and it was exhaustive and boring even if the content wasn't necessarily boring the way it was being presented was and comics can do that too that's why i was i said that everything about peter parker and silver age spider-man was fully formed from the get-go but they didn't drop all that in the first issue it was just consistent you know the first issue of spider-man we were introduced to, to aunt may and we we're introduced uh to him being Spider-Man and his his um, duality, like oh, you know, I've got to be a hero, but I'm also you know downtrodden nerd. It's not fair. And then we get J. Jonah Jameson. We're introduced in like in the next issue, and we're introduced to the idea like oh, well, he's gonna he has to make money um, to pay his aunt's bills. Um, but this guy hates Spider-Man, so he's got to work for like his worst enemy, and the, the, like that entire a little at a time. New villains like. The first issue didn't start with the Sinister Six. He had to build up towards them by meeting these new villains one at a time until he had enough for an evil villain team up. Um, take your time. You know, there's no rush. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And with comic books, you do have some limitations similar to, to, I guess, TV. You have a page count. If you're getting a six-issue story arc, it's going to be very hard to build an enormous, immersive fantasy world. You're probably going to have to keep it in one town. And maybe get a little history of that town, and maybe if it's successful, you can build out from there. But you, you know, you got to think about how much real estate you're going to have to introduce these ideas. Otherwise, you're going to be so you're going to waste all your pages building this world, and you're going to you're not going to have enough time to actually build that awesome, really compelling story built around these really cool characters that people are going to want to come back and, and read more about. Right. So comic books aren't video games and that's the important distinction i think a lot of people when they think world building they think you know oh it's going to be like a video game where i'm going to build this this you know huge landscape with all environments to play in etc cetera, etc cetera. but then you forget your character i mean i like legend of zelda um link isn't really a character though he's just an avatar for the player to move around the screen within that world and that's fine for video games for narratives though all rest on the shoulders of the characters. No one's going to give a, a crap about Middle Earth if they don't give a crap about um, Frodo or Bilbo or the or Gandalf or those people. Your characters need to come first. They need to be fully fleshed out and what their relationship to this world is, and then the reader needs to learn about the world through the character. Like what? How? How is this town that this character is in? How does that town affect the character? What does the character think of that town? And through that relationship, through that dynamic, the reader learns about the town. What What's the uh, your main character's opinion on the politics of your world? Well, that's how your the reader learns about the politics of your of your family. Eyes of the character first, and that's the lens with which the reader should learn about the world, and that's how you build your world. But if you're doing it in reverse, where like, oh, it's like a video game, I, I'm going to build out Hyrule, and then I'm going to drop my character in as an afterthought. Like your character, your audience isn't going to care about your fantasy world because they don't have a character to care about. Yeah, the best example I can think of, and I think most people are going to be familiar with this, is Star Wars. Now, the first 
movie is pretty big in scale. But if you think about uh, everything that's come out of it, it's actually pretty small. You, you've got Luke. We get introduced to the idea of, you know, you get the crawl with some basic introduction to the to the world you're in, like the, the setting. You, you get to see Luke, his perspective on, you know, where he's at in time. And as, you know, he's going along with, with on his adventure with Obi-Wan Kenobi, you start getting some history about his family, some things that maybe he had perceived that were wrong. And as the world is expanding before him, it's also happening for, for the uh, viewer. And now we have this enormous expanded universe, you know, where we've got different eras and spanning galaxies. And it all right. grew from, you know, that one moment in the movie. I mean, heck, when you watch the first Star Wars movie, the original 1977 movie, there were only three settings in that movie. There's the Death Star, Tatooine, and very briefly Yavin 4, the, uh, the forest planet. And that's mm -hmm. it. I mean, it is a huge universe, and they even talk about how big the, the galaxy is. You know, uh, Luke has that one line where, like, well, if there's a bright center of, of the universe, you're on the planet that's farthest from. So it establishes that Tatooine is way out in the boonies, and that's where our story is taking place, is that it's out in the middle of nowhere. We know how big the world is, we know the scope of the Star Wars universe, but we don't see all of it in that first movie. And then and each you see all the aliens, movie, so you know that this yeah. is enormous, diverse life forms that are coming from everywhere. Exactly, and we see that again through through the lens of the main character, Luke. He goes to uh, to Mos Eisley and he sees all those aliens, probably not for the first time for him, but for us as the audience, we see it all for the first time. We get a taste and idea of how big this universe is. And then in each subsequent movie, in Empire Strikes Back, Return of the Jedi, we see a little bit more and a little bit more, and we get the idea, um, finally, of how big the, the world is, the universe. Uh, but they don't show the history us of the Jedi and their importance and how mm -hmm. they they were kind of wiped out at the hands of Darth Vader. Precisely, but they don't show all of that to us in the first movie. In the first movie, we basically just see three settings, and that's enough. And then we want more, and then we get more in each movie. And that's the thing: is you're giving in your first issue, in your first chapter, you're giving your audience a taste of what the world is, not the whole thing, just a taste. And if they like it, they're going to want to come back for more. Whereas if you just stuff them until they're sick, they're not going to want um, you know, a second course. I think that's one of the problems when everyone started wanting to make the shared connected movie, movie universe. I know we're, we're a comic book channel, but we are use this as an example where they wanted to make like the Universal Monsters movies. And yeah. you could see that they were so concerned about world building and introducing these characters that were going to have their own movies later on. And you know, uh, making these connective tissues in the beginning instead of allowing it to progress, and then then tie them together later. And it's you get to the end of the movie of uh, what is it, Dracula Untold? The next one was the Mummy, and you're like, that was a shitty Mummy movie. Why do I want to come back for this? Right. It's it's um it's almost like you just watched a commercial for a whole bunch of movies, like a whole bunch of trailers for a bunch of movies that are going to come out. You didn't don't really feel like you watched a movie in and of itself. You just watched the trailer reel. Um, yeah. And yeah, I, the the universal dark universe just fell flat because of that. Whereas I don't really like the MCU anymore, but there was a time when I did like it, and there was a time when it ruled the world. And but that was because they introduced each character one at a time, and then did the Avengers. And it's the same thing with the Silver Age comics that I'm reading right now. Uh, they introduced Spider-Man, the Fantastic Four, the X-Men, Daredevil, and Thor, and Iron Man, and Captain America, and Hulk, all in their own books. And then they started doing the crossovers and the team-ups, and all that led to Avengers, a, te a team that was comprised of existing characters who all had their own books going at the same time. And so that felt like a huge event, seeing them all come together. Can you they imagine yeah. they started an Avengers book and try to fill in the lore of all those characters, but they weren't able to do it on their single title? I don't know who. I mean, one, I wouldn't want to read that, but I also don't know who would actually want to write something that way. That just sounds like a pain in the ass. It's like you're doing it the hard way. Why are you making it hard on yourself? <laughs> so here on the channel, we're doing all these really fun retrospectives. And in, in the, um, the Marvel ones especially, we're going back and looking at a lot of the Silver Age kind of stuff. And all the stuff that's driving the stories – that we're reading right now and talking about in a retrospectives with Joe Corallo and Eric Breen, like it's all mined out of Fantastic Four, like in 1961 to 66. And it's right, crazy. So this is where all that stuff was introduced and they're paying all these things off decades later. Right. And so Fantastic Four, I have read uh, up through the Galactus trilogy of Fantastic Four, the Silver Age stuff. And that was a few years ago, but I, I do need to go back and reread it. But you can tell that Stan Lee and Jack Kirby, they got a lot of their 
uh, their learning done on the job on Fantastic Four. Because when that book starts, like the characters don't have defined character models. Like uh, I think Thing's design changes like three times in the first issue. Um, their relationships aren't necessarily fully defined. Like um, Ben's in love with Sue and Sue's kind of not nice because she uh, uses that to manipulate Ben into helping them steal the rocket in the first issue. So Sue's not exactly the, the nice girl that she becomes later. Um, and then there's like, there, it, it was still at the time when comic books were magazines, so they would have multiple stories per issue. So there'd be like three Fantastic Four stories in each issue, so they're all really short. Um, and then they finally introduced the book length story. So like you would get an, a complete story, but in, in one issue. So it was a really long story. Uh, then they introduced uh, the story arc, and then they introduced like the the story epic. So you start off with the the frightful four, which is like a three issue story arc, and that leads into the Inhuman saga, which is like a three issue story. Arc. And by the time they get back to New York, the Silver Surfer shows up with Galactus, and it's this huge um, trilogy. But that's like a year long story arc. Uh, but they learned how to write that way in comics. Um, as they were going along. So a lot of the growing pains are in Fantastic Four, including some of the early issues where they were self-aware that they were a comic book. And so they would address the readers directly sometimes, which is weird, but they got over that. Um, but I think all of that ended up paying off for the other books, like Spider-Man of all the Silver Age Marvel books, I think it's the one that reads the best because it had a better idea of what it wanted to be from the beginning. And it didn't have to go through all that learning process and growing pains that Fantastic Four did because Stan Lee and, and uh, Steve Ditko and Jack Kirby had already done all that over in Fantastic Four. That was the one that, that took all the hits uh, for them. So uh, we do have one more kind of topic to talk about, but we are gonna be taking viewer questions in about, <clears throat> I don't know, eight minutes or something like that. So if you have questions, Start putting them into the comments, and we'll put them on the screen, and, and Mark uh, will answer them if he can uh, here in a few minutes. Let's get back. Let's get into the last thing we've kind of talked about. You know, why are you world building? You know, you need to think about your genre. You you need to have rules, establish them. You need to show and don't tell in comic books if you can. You need to build build in incrementally. But really, the the most important thing, really, I think, Mark, is to have fun. Like world building should be one of the most exciting, like creative parts of your entire writing experience you should have a ton of fun you mentioned when you're you you know depending on the setting you're gonna have to do a lot of research but you might get to you know develop new languages you get to come up with a bunch of silly names or maybe you get to come up with a really cool name of your your main character and you get to build all this history and, and weird dynamics and stuff and you'll know, go and, and have fun with it create a character bible create a world bible of all the history maybe it won't make it in the comic book but it's really going to drive your story and people are going to know you're passionate about it Right. If you're having fun, then your readers are having fun. And that's the important thing to keep in mind. If you come at it and so you're writing everything in a really workmanlike uh, fashion where you're just like, I just got to get this script over with whatever, that's going to come across in your writing have fun. But if you're really diving into it head first, and this is why I think indie comics are so important, is because these are your creations, you own them, they're your ideas that you're building from the ground up, so you have an actual stake in this as opposed to being, you know, someone who's who's hired to write somebody else's property. Um, and it shows, and you're, you have a lot of fun, and we talked to Chuck Dixon once, uh, Tim and I, we were on a radio show with him, and one of the things that he, he said is that when you're a writer and you do a lot of research and a lot of legwork um, to build your characters, you write all, all these background materials, you, you write your, your character profiles, you write your story Bibles, you, you write your source books, um, you, you, you do all your research, you meticulously plot out everything. I, part of your ego wants to show that in the work. Like you want everyone to know just how hard you worked. And so if you did a whole ton of research on, uh, I don't know, on automobiles from the 1930s, uh, you want to put all of what you learned into that book so everyone can see how smart you are. So everyone can see how much research you did. And that doesn't, that may satisfy your ego, but that won't make necessarily make for a good reading experience for the writer, for the audience. Instead, what you want to do is put a tenth of all of that into your, visibly into your story. The rest is all going to be organic. And that's what's going to make the characters feel uh, realistic. And that's what's going to make the world feel lush and lived in and authentic. Uh, not if the characters have to stop what they're doing to basically <laughs> read everything that you wrote from the character profile or from uh, the source book or just like, ah, I'm, I'm going to read the, uh, the, 
uh, owner's manual for a 1952 Ford because I had to read it. So now the audience has to read it. So they're going to know what research I did. That's not good. That's not fun to read. Um, so sometimes you just you have to fight that urge to show off um, mm -hmm. and instead just be more concerned with how your story reads and if it's enjoyable. Hey, if people love it, you could make a world Bible, sell it separately, mm -hmm. and the hardcores will go over there and they'll know all the research that you did. <laughs> but you got to establish the universe and establish the fandom first. So I do want to ask you about this, Mark. I've, I've read your USAGI stuff. In the first issue, you, you said the, the the main character, he doesn't speak, but he does have a language. Like, who developed that? Was that you? Was that Tim? Was that you guys together? Because it's, I think it's pretty was... fun because he's like, he's, he's it's very basic. He's, he's like speaking in like, uh, you know, sticks. Oh uh, yeah, it's um so yeah, pictograms. So that's what we call them. Like uh, the kids these days would call them emojis, but we call them pictograms. But yeah, that was um that was a solution to one of the problems that we had with a character who's mute, um, is that he can't talk. And we had the dossier narration, but there was a, only a certain level of um, interaction and exposition that the dossier narration was suited for. We needed to have some way to show that USAGI could interact with other animals. Um, and how he was communicating with them, because these are realistic animals. They don't um, they don't emote cartoonishly. So when two rabbits are talking to each other or looking at each other and sniffing each other, you don't know what's going through their heads because they can't um, put it on their faces the way humans can. Um, so the the pictograms were something I, th I think I might have come up with it. Um, I, th I think I did, um, and then Tim and I um, like developed it together. But yeah, the pictograms was just a way of having kind of a, a fun. Um, way of illustrating the characters, um, the animal characters communicating back and forth, but without using text because we they can't talk, so they can't think in human language. Um, but yeah, that was that's um, and it's part of the world building. All the animals in our stories do that, and we've had a lot of fun um, with the kinds of pictograms we'll use. Like um, if a character like Patriot Otter, um, who we introduced in the second volume, um, he's a really angry otter. So when he's screaming at USAGI, his little pictogram will be a smaller drawing of his face screaming <laughs> because there isn't any anything uh, clever that he's trying to put like string together with a bunch of little pictures. He's just angry. Uh, so yeah, you can just have fun like that with your um your world. Absolutely. So you know, have fun with it. It's your baby. You did all this work. Make sure it's enjoyable and, and do, have some some interesting things for for people to experience. Mark, do you have anything else that maybe another uh, anecdote or something to kind of uh, demonstrate how you can have fun creating these worlds or you want to get right into uh, viewer questions? I, I think we pretty much um, covered every, everything. You you wrote a pretty uh, um, all-inclusive syllabus, and I think we covered all of it. So, no, I don't we think we left anything on the table. <laughs> yeah. All right, so we do have some questions from the viewers. We'll start out. We'll go in order. A computer robot says, I know this is off topic, but how do you feel about Dr. Doom getting married soon to one of his female servants? Well, that's more of a, a your department question. I haven't been keeping up with that book. <laughs> I haven't really either. I imagine this is um, this is happening in Fantastic Four. Uh, I, Dan Slot's writing, but I don't know. He's Dr. Doom if he wants to get married. He's the yeah, king, I, and you know, kings normally wouldn't marry servants. You'd, you'd expect that they would marry... Uh, you know, somebody from the political class, but you know it's Latveria. Maybe it's a different, it's a different political system there. There, Mark. I mean, from what I know of, like of Doctor Doom, I, I sometimes he's in love with Sue, depending on the the canon. Sometimes he isn't, but I've never really. I've always kind of viewed him as just being celibate. He's way too single minded in uh, in his pursuits. One to 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 best uh, Richards and the other to save his, his gypsy mom from hell. He has like, those are his two motivating goals. That's all he cares about. That's all he thinks about is Richards. I just can't see him taking time out to fall in love and get married. That just never strikes me as something Victor would do. Uh, but if it's written well, I mean, hey, these are comics uh, characters that have been around for 70 years. Uh, they can change and do whatever they want. And as long as it's written well, I mean, heck, I, I love Swamp Thing. Uh, Swamp Thing's one of my I think it's my favorite DC book. I'm you know, Batman sometimes, but uh, Alan Moore, when he picked up Swamp Thing, he completely rewrote uh, Alec Holland's origin. Uh, Swamp Thing was never Alec Holland. Uh, Swamp Thing was a creature created by the Green, which was a, and he did all that world building, you know, just to tie, loop it back around to the, the topic. Um, he introduced the concept of the Green. He introduced the concept of these uh, um, elemental spirits of which Swamp Thing was one, and it completely rewrote what Swamp Thing was and who he was 
but I mean, it's Alan Moore and he wrote it really well and it's become a foundational part of Swamp Thing's mythology and lore. So you can introduce my, stuff like my that. Five favorite comic stories ever. <laughs> yeah, the anatomy lesson, it's so good. Um, yeah. But so yeah, you can you can do that. Uh, you just, you gotta be Alan Moore if you wanna pull it off though. So just make sure you're doing it right. <laughs> we got a question from Jalady uh, Gibner. When you start out world building, does it help to initially have the main character names locked in? I mean, the names, yeah. Um, I always kind of feel like that's the most uh, loose part of a character, unless the name is, is somehow like really built into their identity. What um, was like Luke it, like, uh, Skywalker's? Was it Star? Star Killer? Yeah. Star Killer, yeah. Yeah, and then they, they changed it because it sounded like, oh, he doesn't sound very heroic if he's going around yeah, he's killing stars. Yeah. Um, <laughs> like the, the main weapon's called the Death Star that kills <laughs> things. So, yeah. Um, so, I think that you shouldn't necessarily have to be married to a name um, unless it's really parts of who, the, if you're naming the book after the character, then yeah, you probably want to stick with that name. But if it just comes down to like, do I name him Alan or Brian or Jeff? You know, um, I, I don't think necessarily. We actually, um, for Common America, we came up with our characters and we came up with their first names um, like Carly and Nisha and Vicky, um, but we, and Sylvia, but for a lot of them, we actually didn't come up with their last names until fairly recently. Like Vicky didn't have a last name until uh, Common America Volume Four, um, I think, is when we finally um, mentioned her last name because it just it wasn't important. Like the name Vicky was important. Like we had that going since the first issue, but a last name was just something we didn't need, so we never really put thought into that. Um, and then we we came up with one that that turned out really good that we like. Um, so yeah, now, I, th if, I think if your characters like nobility and there's castles yeah, built yeah. after him, you're probably going to want to have a cool name that you know works for a castle and maybe a you know a city or something. Exactly, um, and if your character is like derivative of a um, public domain literary figure like Lupin the Third, you know, uh, then or yeah, so then the name is important. Mm -hmm. So it all, all depends on the story. We got another question from Jelani. Uh, do you prefer coming up with more fictional city, community, or world, or do you like basing your main locations on real world city areas? Uh, I like a, a mix. Um, so for like Common America, uh, that's that story takes place in Oscar, Indiana, which is a fictional town in Indiana. Um, we we set it close to Indianapolis, so that if we do need to go to a real world city that people you know have a have a, a grounding in, uh, then we can. Um, but otherwise, you know, it, it's something that's um, malleable. We don't have to worry too much about um, getting all of the landmarks and city streets and locations right. Um, but it is something that feels authentic enough that that people aren't um, looking at it like, oh, that doesn't exist. O Oscar, Indiana sounds like it could be a real place. Uh, whereas with uh, USAGI, uh, that one is a much harder book to write for a lot of reasons. And it's much more challenging. And one of them is that we set a lot of it in real world locations. That first volume of uh, USAGI uh, takes place at, and I can't even pronounce it, but an actual North Korean nuclear launch site. And so- it's Pyongyang, right? Uh, Pyongyang, I think, yeah. Uh, Pyongyang Ri or something like that, Pyongyang Ri. Mm -hmm. But we had to find satellite but photographs Pyongyang, of right, it. Right. Pyongyang, yeah. yeah. Um, we had to find satellite photographs of it. We had to look at um, the location around it. So he, he starts out uh, in the in the jungle around it and then he has to infiltrate it we had to figure out okay where's the uh, like where's the uh, launch uh, platform okay where's the communications headquarters where's the front gate and then we had to build our story of his infiltration around the actual landmarks of that real world location and that was a pain and then in black cops volume two it takes place on Hart Island which is an actual island off the coast of New York City um, it's the Popper's Field Island full of graves. And so we had to make sure that, again, the infiltration point was a real point. All of the geography was correct. Um, that if he was going to have an entrance into the um, secret underground base, that had to be a real fixed location on the island. And he had to get there following a real path um, across the geography. And that was a pain. Um, it's uh, I think it's a lot easier to write just fictional locations, but it depends on your story and if it matters. If your story needs to take place in a real world setting, then yes, um, set it in your real world setting and do your research to get your landmarks right. If it doesn't matter so much, if it, if it takes place in anywhere USA, then go ahead and, and set it in, in a fictional Small town. Yes, yeah, Smallville, there you go, <laughs> right? 
Absolutely. Yeah, but uh, you if you're going to put it in the real world, you better make it right because people are going to call you out and it's going to take yeah. away – somebody that's from there is going to read the book and be like, nope. The, yeah, the internet will always find out when you screw up. So. <laughs> Absolutely. So we got another question from How to Write Comics with Angelo. I'm writing a science fiction story about space bounty hunters who deal with a new bounty character alien each episode. How do I keep coming up with new alien characters? Now that sounds like a fun problem to have. It, you know, it really, really does. Uh, <laughs> I'm waiting on a on a book in the mail. I've ordered it off of eBay twice, and I and it keeps getting lost or sent back, or the seller has a problem. But it's um, one of the Chaosium source books for uh, H.P. Lovecraft monsters, and I just love that stuff. I, I don't uh, play role playing games, but I do love <laughs> reading the the, the profile of the source books. They're just yeah, the source <laughs> material. I just find all that really fun because it really just ignites the imagination. And I love the artwork in them too. This one's from the '80s when they had these gorgeous painted art of all these horrible nightmare monsters. Um, but yeah, I I think that if we if we're talking aliens, um, ah, the sky's the limit with aliens. I would just be yeah. reading alien fiction and looking right? at pictures. <laughs> I mean, look. So yeah, look at different aliens from different um, different sources, different films, different comics, different TV shows. But with aliens, I think uh, one thing to keep in mind is that. Um, they all evolved on their home world, wherever that was, and their evolutionary traits um, are centered where the uh, topographical or climate features were on their home world. And so that, that's a really um, easy starting point for coming up with um, weird aliens with weird abilities that make them a challenge um, for your main character. Um, you have an alien from a uh, from an ice planet, so maybe it's got a really thick hide. And you got an alien from a volcano planet, so maybe it, it's um, really resilient to heat. Um, heck, look at uh, the xenomorphs from the Alien franchise, how they work. Um, each xenomorph is different depending on the creep the traits of the creature. From. Yeah, it spawned from. So you get the dog alien from Alien Three that can run really fast and cling to walls. Um, and you get a whole bunch of the weird ones from the old Kenner toy line, like the rhino alien and the snake alien and the gorilla alien, and they're all really cool. Um, so you can just have a lot of fun with with that kind of thing. If you just think about like, well, or you can get really trippy, like, oh, maybe you've got um, an alien from a gas planet. So how do you um, hunt a bounty on, on on something that's basically a cloud of vapor? You know, you get to conflicts like that. It can be a lot of fun. But I hope what he's talking about with bounty hunters. I hope this is like an old west setting. And maybe you can get a xenomorph with a cowboy hat. <laughs> yes, That's I'm I sure like. there's got to be art of that somewhere. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, I would, that would have that would be a that's a good problem. Now I would just be reading well, only that if and watching if so much alien stuff. Only if the tiny xenomorph mouth that pops out also has a tiny cowboy hat. On it's it. got to have it, right? <laughs> yeah. And he tips it. Yeah, because yeah. he's in town one getting a drink. <laughs> yeah, that would be uh, that would be fun. Thanks for the question, Angel. That would be. Uh, Get to watch a bunch of cool cartoons and movies. Yeah, right. You get to do the fun kind of research. <laughs> yep. Common sense. Uh, I might be misremembering for TV pilots. Why executives want to reveal too much about world building? Do they do that to even uh, add adaptations to? What is the right pacing for world building in episodes? Is there a completely right pacing? Does it depend on the medium, page count? Well, I mean, if it's something like a, a sitcom, and I think that a lot of TV executives come from uh, that. A mind frame. So like a sitcom, you can do all your world building in the opening theme song, you know, like my two sons, my wife is dead. <laughs> no, I've got two sons. La la. Okay. That's the premise. You know, uh, you, you can get all that done. And then there's no world building in a sitcom after that. It's, it's just situational comedy in every episode. Like, Oh no, I've got, uh, I'm, I promised two girls. I date them on the same night. What do I do? You know, something like that. Um, John Rigger must be gay. You know, why would he be living with two women? <laughs> That's the conflict of every episode. John Ritter proving yeah. he's not gay. <laughs> um, or, yeah, you, here you get like Hogan's Heroes where they got to like, oh, we got to escape the POW camp. Ah, oh, darn it, Colonel Clint got us again. But we'll get out next week maybe. I don't know. <laughs> Unless the show's canceled. Then we're all like. Um, yeah, for the right pacing for world building, uh, basically just think of it like a slow drip, you know, um, what, however much you need for a scene, if you introduce a new villain and, uh, the audience and the characters need to know where this villain is coming from. Well, that's an opportunity to do some world building to say where the villain came from. If the villain has, um, crazy powers or a weird connection back to where he came from, that's your opportunity to describe that place that he came from. Um, 
so every new element that you introduce into your story is an open door to introduce more world building. It, it, it's stealthy and subliminal, um, but it gets across to the audience. And heck, that's how Star Wars does things. Every time they introduce a new alien, like Chewbacca, right? Chewbacca is a Wookiee from Kashyyyk, and Wookiees live in tree houses, and they're all huge, and they all have big claws so they can climb trees. So they're and they're all savage. But yeah, you learn all that through Chewbacca because Chewbacca was introduced that way. Um, it's just think of it that way. Like whenever you're introducing something new, that's your golden opportunity to do some world building. This is a good question. We could talk about Star Wars here again. Mm -hmm. Is there any organic way to go back and change things about your world as you begin fleshing them out or am I stuck with it? All right, according to George Lucas, no, you can go and change. Mm -hmm. Every single episode, he changes something that was firmly established in the previous one. He does. Um, and I think that also kind of drives audiences crazy, though. It does. Um, but there's a good way and a bad way to do it. Like, um, just speaking comics, we already talked about Swamp Thing. Alan Moore completely rewrote Swamp Thing's origin, but he also introduced a ton of new mythology elements, and it worked out great. That's been the default version of Swamp Thing since he introduced it. Um, the other side, you have J. Michael Straczynski rewriting Spider-Man's origin so that his powers are actually magical, and he's the, the mystical spider totem, and um, he was predestined to uh, ga gain those spider powers. And... That sucks. <laughs> I mean, I like J. Michael Straczynski as a writer for a lot of things, but not for Spider-Man. I hated um, that rewrite of his origin. And I think outside of um, the few times like Spider-Verse, when um, what, what was the name of the, the villain from that story who's going around hunting everybody down? Great. Um, um, no, no. In, um, in the Spider-Verse comic, darn it. Is it uh, whatever. It doesn't matter. But basically, it was a good way and a bad way. Uh, you have to be Morlun. Morlun, thank you, Morlun. There we go. Um, anyway, you you have to. It's better to not have to do it. If you change your mind down the road later um, and you want to change something up, you're going to have to think long and hard about how you're going to execute it to make it seem like that was the plan all along. Because readers can tell when you're changing your mind and thus changing your story to accommodate your new your new idea. And that takes them out of the immersion of the experience. They can a, a reader can smell a retcon from a mile away, and if they're reading something and they know it's a retcon, then that's just going to throw them off. And they're like, "All right, like, I'm I'm reading something written by an editor, not by a creator," and that messes everything up. So it's really important to have all those things thought out in advance. But if you do have to do it, um, it can be done. Um, there are great examples like Swamp creative. Thing of how it can be done. But yeah, you got to get creative and you've got to think um, really hard about it. Mm -hmm. We got another question from uh, Jero. I think it's Jero. Maybe it's Jer Zero. One or the other. Are writer artist teams at a disadvantage compared to artists that write when it comes to world building? I th I think it's two better. Two heads are better than one, right? I think so. I mean, that's how uh, Tim and I have done it. I mean, I've I've read a lot of uh, comics that were written by the artists, and a. Bad. They have great art, um, but bad world building, bad scripting, bad storytelling fundamentals. I mean, go back and read like the first, I think it was only the first four issues of Spawn when Todd McFarlane wrote those before he hired Alan Moore and Grant Morrison and Neil Gaiman and Frank Miller to write the book for him. It, it wasn't good. Um, his run on Spider-Man, great art, but the issues that were written by Todd, like um, Torment, that's just six issues of Spidey fighting the lizard. And there is no plot to that. I, I don't know. Every time I read Torment, I'm like, how is this six issues? How did he stretch something so thin out? Like, because there's no story to it. It's just a vehicle for his art. And the art's great, but it's uh, superficial. There, there's It's hollow on the inside. There's no story. I think that having a, a writer artist team, as long as they're equals and it's not like just one hiring the other to do a job for them, that they're actually colla truly collaborating and co-creating what they're doing, that you're going to end up with something um, much more, much fuller and uh, well realized because you have two people editing each other and um, improving each other and, and plussing each other essentially. Um, and so you end up with a better um, storyline. You with um, better art, better writing, you get the best of both worlds. Um, Plus, if you do to... something that's inconsistent, you're like, well, we're, we plan on doing this later. We can't do it now. And, you know, just two eyes on it. It's going to keep everything a little cleaner. Right. They'll, you're, 
your artist will catch you or your writer will catch you um, if you mess something up. So you basically, you've got someone um, co-editing with you and that can uh, save you a lot of trouble and a lot of heartache. Absolutely. So we have a question from L. Kim Lo C. I'm writing a story in where all the characters are robots. Do you have any tips or sources I could use on how to write a violent, disturbing scenes involving said characters? Uh, I do want to say be before he says this, there's a comic book. It's just it's five issues. It's called The Kill Lock from Livio Ramondelli at IDW. He's the writer artist, um, and you might enjoy that. It it probably will be some inspiration for you because it's it's an entire robot civilization. There's some very violent scenes, and I would just suggest if you can go find The Kill Lock. It's an excellent story. The art's amazing, and you might find some things that will inspire your story. I'm sorry, Mark. Oh, no, that, that was a good example. Um, what I think of when I, when I think of robots and robot violence, the first thing that pops into my head is Transformers. And what I like about Transformers is that um, because they're sentient robots that can think and feel, um, if they get shot, if they get their arms chopped off, it hurts. Uh, they have their, their concept of gore is different from ours, but it's gore none the, none the same. Um, there's an episode of Transformers Prime, that CG animated cartoon, where um, Bulkhead is fighting, I think it's uh, one of the Viacons, like the drones, and uh, Miko, who's the little human girl, is watching, and Bulkhead's getting into this brutal fight with his Decepticon, and he's got the Decepticon by the throat, and he's got his fist drawn back, and he looks down at Miko and says, Miko, look away! And then he drives his fist into the, uh, the chest of the Viacon and rips out his internal circuitry. Like he's, like he's doing a Mortal Kombat finishing move, but they're robots. So he's just ripping out, you know, like parts and gears and stuff. But to him, that's gore. To him, he just ripped out the, the heart and squished it in his hand. To us, it's, it's just an engine block. Um, but that context made that scene so much more violent as opposed to say the Ninja Turtle is like slashing a foot soldier robot and, the, and the exploding like in a video game. Um, we know that it's just a robot to them. He just killed another living creature and ripped out his organs and did something hideously violent. And the context is there that makes that scene so much more disquieting. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you can do a lot of crazy, disturbing robot violence that doesn't change the fact that they're robots. You just have to give it the context that from their perspective, um, it, what they're doing is really disturbing and gross. Robots are fun to work with, especially from an artist's perspective. You know, you're working with things that you know, shouldn't have, like, uh, emotions on their face. And so you have to... <laughs> To do some interesting stuff. So definitely check out Kill Lock if you have it. That one's great. So we got another question from Federico de la Casa. Thank you so much for joining us. It seems odd, but for being a toy line, Masters of the Universe was shaped in a very interesting and archetypal world. What do you think? Interesting. Uh, I think they introduced the the story of Masters of the Universe in comic books. They did in the Packin uh, comics. What's funny is if you go back and you watch the first episode of Masters of the Universe, the, the Diamond Ray of Disappearance, there is no exposition, there is no, they just throw you in there. They assume you're gonna know who He-Man and Skeletor and Eternia and Castle Grayskull are. There's just no context and it's fine and it works. Uh, when it comes to Masters of the Universe with He-Man, I love the idea of it. I love the world of it. I don't like most of the shows and the comics um, on it. The only one I really liked was the 2002 one um, that aired on Toonami way back in the day. Um, I actually love that show. That's my favorite version of He-Man, but I'm not a big fan of the Filmation cartoon. Um, I didn't watch the She-Ra thing on Netflix, and I'm probably not gonna watch the Kevin Smith He-Man show either. I do like the 80s movie, the live action one, um, but I kind of like it more because it's a canon film than <laughs> because of so anything bad. else. Oh, shit, my cat just uh, tore down my fucking shower. Jesus, I think my cat just tried to <laughs> Uh, climbed the shower curtain and ripped it off the wall. That's that's great. Um, yeah, no, okay, yeah, I think I'm going to have to close this up then. But yeah, no, um, I do like He-Man, but uh, the interesting thing about He-Man and the only reason it, it works is because it started out as a toy line because normally you can't mix, oh, he's a barbarian, but it's also science fiction, but it's also got magic and it's also got robots and vehicles, but they're also on this um, like crazy uh, middle earth landscape. It's like all these different things like mashed together. And in a normal narrative, that wouldn't work. That'd be too many flavors. But because it came from a toy line, you know, you, you write um, to make fun toys. Uh, that's the end goal. And that ends up making uh, Master Universe unique. All right. So you have to go? I'll, yeah, I'll I got these I gotta, questions gotta, real, real quick. Uh, uh, how do you spot 
problems in your script. If you got an a-hole friend like myself, let them read it for you. They're going to tell you everything wrong with it. Mm, and yeah. then uh, any suggestions on finding an artist? That's going to be really, really hard. Artists are uh, really yeah, really Honestly, I'm, right I'm kind of just lucky that I lucked into knowing Tim for such a long time. <laughs> yeah. Because uh, when it comes to actually hunting down artists, I don't really have any tips on that. Yeah. So. It's actually pretty difficult right now. There are more writers than artists, especially with all the crowdfunding stuff blowing up. Uh, Mark, thank you so much. I'm sorry about the cat. Well, I don't know uh, the extent. And I think I can get my um, shower curtain pole back up on the wall. I guess I'll find out. <laughs> He's just I being a dick. I was, <laughs> I'm sorry about the cat. Thank you so much, Mark. We had a good time. Thank you for all your questions. I'm sorry we we're having to bow out early, but Mark <laughs> has a shower curtain to fix. Yeah. I, uh, thanks, everybody, for listening. I had a great time, and hopefully uh, Aaron can join us next week. That's it.